Hi, I'm Jan Kamenisch and I'm running the Research and Crypto Department at Definity. Today, we're going to take a look under the hood of the Internet Computer and talk about chain key technology. The Internet Computer is uh, governed by a protocol, the Internet Computer Protocol, that directs and connects nodes that are uh, running all over the world. The protocol allows uh, developers to upload canisters onto the internet computer and it then directs the node to run those canisters uh, on the internet computer. Users can then connect to canisters and canisters can connect to other canisters in order to execute and, uh, the functionalities the developers have uh, programmed. And canisters can implement about any, anything. It could be web pages that are served by canisters. It could implement an enterprise system or open internet service, sort of open versions of uh, LinkedIn or Facebook or any other internet service. It could also implement uh, distributed exchanges uh, as well. So what is a canister? Well, a canister is really like a, a bunch of code when it contains of program code and it also contains the, the state of the program. And then when uh, a user interacts with a canister, it sends uh, the user, they send a message uh, to the canister or to like, one node of the internet computer. And then the internet computer executes the canister on the input of that message and eventually compute like, an output message that then the user can query back. By executing the message, the state of the canister is updated to reflect the, the latest changes or whatever the developer actually wanted the, the canister to do. Now, a canister can also cut out to uh, other canisters via, during its execution. So it can use another canister as a library or a subsystem. And so in order to process a message then from a user, the canister would send a message to another canister and get the reply back that it would, would then use uh, to process its message. And now, of course, the whole thing needs to be secured. That's the whole point of the internet computer, to provide a scalable, a secure uh, environment for such canisters uh, to run. Uh, obviously, if a canister would only be run on a single machine, then uh, the machine could crash, or it could be malicious or faulty, and we wouldn't be sure whether the messages that the user gets back are actually correctly computed. Therefore, the internet computer connects nodes that would then, in a replicated fashion, execute a canister. So essentially, uh, the nodes would all uh, execute the canister on the input that message, and then after that execution, they would uh, agree upon whether or not they obtain the same result. And if they indeed do obtain the same result, they would then only then uh, send that result back to the user. To achieve correctness and robustness of the results computed uh, by the internet computer, a canister is not run on a single node, but run on multiple nodes, because the single nodes could fail and then the state would be lost, or a node could be malicious and then actually the result might not be correct. So what we do is that the canisters will, or the protocol will uh, make sure that the canisters are run on multiple nodes, and this then take the message, run the canister on the message, and afterwards make sure that they have achieved uh, the same result. So this guarantees that canisters run forever and the, the results they compute are actually correct. Uh, in order to do that, of course, the user, when it uh, talks to uh, the user, when she talks to the internet computer, it wants to be sure that the result is in the, indeed uh, authenticated so that it could not be modified somewhere in transit. And to this end, uh, the internet computer has a public key and the corresponding signing key. And then the nodes, after having computed the results of a canister execution, would sign that result jointly together. So to this end, we actually use threshold signature schemes. So that means every node has their own shared secret key from that threshold key. And then with that scheme, they each sign, like a, produce a partial signature on that uh, computed result. And when enough of them, like uh, two thirds of them, or more than two thirds of them, have uh, agreed that uh, the result is correct and have signed that result, then you can combine these signatures into a full signature, a full certificate on the message that then is uh, sent back to the user. So this is actually one of the very cool features of chain key technology. Namely now with a single public key, you can actually validate uh, the responses, the computation of the internet computer. So all you need to know is a single 48 byte value and the public key of the internet computer, with that you can verify the correctness. 
Compared, for instance, to Ethereum, the open Ethereum client needs to download 400 gigabytes in order to validate the result. Or depending on the client, it can be, even be larger. It can be for GATC, it can be up to 700 gigabytes. Or if you want to be an archive node, actually you have to download almost 7,000 gigabytes. That value actually grows. It was just a bit more than 200 gigabyte a year ago. Now it has grown over 400 gigabyte within a year. So it will grow linearly with time. Whereas for the internet computer, it will be a single value, these 48 bytes, that is all that you really need. So let us take a step back and see how the internet computer actually distributes the canisters on all the nodes. Because obviously we cannot compute all canisters on all the nodes because that wouldn't scale at all. Also, we would have millions of nodes that would run the same canisters. But of course, on the other hand, we need to run a canister on sufficiently many nodes such that we get the security properties that we just talked about. So for that reason, we have to split all the nodes uh, into a subset of nodes, and each subnet we call like a, a subnet. And so these subnets are sufficiently large, and then canisters are, uh, or different canisters are assigned onto different subnets where they get run. Now, of course, in order for uh, the subnets to talk to each other, to authenticate their messages, but also to authenticate messages towards the user, each of those subnets will have their own public keys. So every subnet has their own public keys, or, and also all the nodes of the subnet have a key share of those public keys. And now, of course, when, when a user gets to uh, see a message that is authenticated with a subnet, it will be signed with that subnet or when a canister calls out to another canister and receives a uh, response, that message will also be signed with, the, with respect to the subnet key. So that means now we certainly have many public keys, so it's a statement that I was just making before wrong, right? Because now certainly we seem to have to store a number of uh, public keys in order to validate responses from the different subnets. Well, no, that's not, not quite the case because we have like a special subnet that we call the NNS subnet or the Network Neural System subnet. The NNS subnet orchestrates all the other subnets. So for instance, it, it will decide which nodes go to which subnets. The NNS subnet will also certify the keys of these, all these subnets. And there, therefore now, uh, a subnet has the, its public key, but it also has a certificate from the NNS subnet on that public key. And now, if there is a message that the user receives uh, from a subnet signed by the subnet's key, the subnet can then uh, pass along that certificate from the NNS subnet uh, and then all the user needs is the public key of the NNS subnet, and then it can validate the certificate of the subnet's public key, and then ver uh, validate uh, the certificate on the message, on the response uh, it gets, or the user gets from a subnet. So really what, what we have is, uh, although the internet is powered by millions of nodes and thousands of subnets, all we really need is a single public key to validate the results from any of those subnets. As all the subnets have their own keys, there is a ton of subnets, thousands of subnets, and there's a lot of keys, a lot of key shares that the individual nodes of these subnets have. And now the question is, how can we manage all these keys? How we can generate all these keys? How can we maintain that? In particular, nodes may, may fail, they might be compromised, or even be malicious and maybe broadcast some of those keys. So there, there's two main procedures here that we need to support. The first one is the NNS, as we have seen, that generates um, new subnets, it instructs nodes to form a new subnets. The NNS will generate the public key of the subnet, but also the key shares for the individual nodes of the subnet, and also the certificate on the public key of the subnet. So we need to be able to do that in a way that uh, scales to, to uh, hundreds of thousands of subnets. On the other hand, once a subnet has received their public key and the, the nodes have received their individual key shares, they need to be able to maintain that throughout uh, the lifetime of a subnet. So nodes might fail, they might lose their uh, key shares, other nodes might be, uh, become corrupt or, or malicious and maybe uh, for that reason excluded from the subnet. So the nodes together need to have to operate in the, the, that key material to maintain their operations. So how can we do that? Let's look at that. So we use uh, something that's called threshold signature scheme. A threshold signature scheme consists of a number of algorithms. So first of all, there's a key generation algorithm where a dealer, typically a trusted party, generates the public key and the key shares uh, for the parties that are later going to use the threshold signature scheme. So in our case, that will be the nodes of a subnet. 
Then there's a signing algorithm where the individual parties, in our case again the nodes, would use their secret key share to produce a partial signature on a message. Now once sufficiently many nodes have signed, sufficiently many parties have used their secret keys to generate a partial signature, those signatures can be combined into an overall signature on the message. And that only works if sufficiently many, like three out of four uh, parties have signed the message, for instance. That combined signature can then be verified against the public key that was generated originally. Let's see how we can generate the keys here for the nodes. Now, on the internet computer, we cannot afford a single trusted party that generates those keys, because the assumption here is that the computer should be secure as long as uh, more than two-thirds of the parties are correct. That means we have to be able to tolerate some parties that, that are malicious. And in particular, if we were out of luck and chose a dealer that would generate those keys for us that would be malicious, the whole system would fail. Would fail. So there's two ways here that we can address that, two, two tricks, if you want so. The first one is uh, cryptographic zero knowledge proofs that prove the correctness of some statement. So in our case, if a dealer generates the keys, the public keys and the secret key shares for the different nodes, it would encrypt those key shares uh, for those nodes and provide a cryptographic proofs that what is encrypted in, in the ciphertext is actually a correct sharing with respect to the public key that, it also, that the party also provides. So that's the first ingredient here. Now, of course, we still are stuck with a single party that does that. So now we somehow need to figure out how can we make sure that this single party is not malicious. And the trick here is that we actually use multiple parties. So we have a number of parties that do sharings here, do those proofs. So we have a number of sharings, a number of uh, public keys, number of proofs. So we can verify that all of those are correct. But now the properties that we have here of these secret keys and public keys are actually that they are what we call uh, homomorphic. So that means that there is a mathematical operation that we can do on the public keys uh, to compress them, if you so want, into a single public key. And the same thing we can do on, on the secret keys, the same thing. So that means if we apply those, that mathematical operation on the public keys as well on the secret keys, we can compress a number of sharings into single sharing. And as we know that uh, each of those sharings are correct because we verified the proof, we know that the resulting sharing is also correct. So we have a correct public key and we have a number of correct secret keys. So now what we have done is we, have, we can have a number of dealers that do sharings and then we combine them into a single sharing. Then we're guaranteed that as long as a single dealer is honest, the whole scheme will be secure. Namely, what, what, what do we need uh, for the scheme to be secure? Well, it, we require that the keys are generated perfectly random and the keys were not leaked or not published by the dealer. As the homomorphic operation here works on, on the whole space, it is actually mathematically guaranteed that as long as one of those keys was uh, purely random and is not leaked, the resulting uh, key is purely random and is uh, kept secret as well. So now we have seen how we can non-interactively generate uh, secret keys and public keys for subnets. And that's actually now how we use that for the NNS subnet to generate new subnets. So each node of the NNS subnet will be a dealer and uh, computer sharing, a dealing. And then uh, the, together the nodes in the NNS would combine that public key into single public key and certify that public key. So once all that material is computed, uh, it is sent to the nodes who form a new subnet. They will decrypt all of that, combine their secrets into like a single secret uh, key share, combine the public key to obtain a public key of the NNS, and they're ready to go to start a new subnet. So now the nodes of a subnet have received their secret key shares, subnet has received the public key, and they start uh, their operations. But now if a node crashes, loses its secret key, or if a node is to join, and then the nodes need to manage those uh, secret keys and while keeping the public key of the subnet uh, stable. How can we do that? Because we, don't, we do not want to regenerate uh, the keys because then that would change the subnet's public key. So we want to keep that uh, stable. So the trick here is that in some sense we apply the, the same mechanism as before, but just a little different. Namely, what, what we want to do is here that the subnet's nodes, each of them reshares their secret key 
for the other nodes, actually the new setup of nodes, because some of the nodes might be crashed, or the NNS might have assigned new nodes to the subnet. Each node will take their secret key and share that secret key with all the other nodes on the subnet. Again, as, as the dealer would have done as well, those shares are encrypted under the, under the public keys of the nodes, so we have a number of ciphertext. We also encrypt, of course, the secret key share that, that uh, the nodes has. And then the node produces, again, a cryptographic proofs that that sharing is correct, that it's all valid. But once sufficiently many of the nodes have reshared their secret key onto a new set of nodes, that new set of nodes can decrypt the, these individual sharings and combine them again into a full sharing of uh, a full sharing of the secret key that corresponds to the public key of the subnet. In particular, if we have a sub, if we have a subnet with shares, a node crashed, the NNS would assign a new node to the subnet. Then the nodes, uh, the remaining nodes, would share uh, their secret keys for the new subnet of the nodes. And then after that sharing has happened, the new, sub, the new set of the nodes can obtain from that a new sharing of the same public key. So again, it's, it's important here that the public key of the subnet actually remains unchanged. Now, the secret key shares alone are not sufficient to participate in a subnet, because remember, the subnet or each nodes of the subnet run those canisters, and of course the state of the canisters uh, will change over, over time. And if a new node adds to the subnet, and after we have done this new resharing of the keys, it will have a keys, but it doesn't have the state of these canisters, so it cannot really participate and help the subnet run that canister. So the trick here is now that the other nodes need to tell the new subnet of that state. Of course, again, in a fashion that the new node is actually sure that it will have received the correct state. So how could a new node that now has uh, received the key share uh, receive the states? It could start operations. Uh, in principle, we could just ask any other nodes for that state. But then uh, remember, we cannot trust the single node. So it would have somehow ask all the nodes. Or alternatively, actually, that these remaining nodes they could certify, authenticate th that uh, state of the canisters, and then send that all to the new node. And that's exactly what, what we do. So we. Uh, regularly authenticate the state of all the canisters and of course the canisters themselves as well and together with the sharings uh, of the old secret keys for the new set of nodes that will be enough information for a new node to join a subnet and actually operate along with the other nodes in that subnet and that certified state and the new sharings that's what we call the catch-up package and that catch-up package is all you need uh, for a node to join a subnet. And the catch-up package is actually a very powerful uh, tool. Namely, it allows really the, the uh, nodes of a subnet to maintain the, the subnet in, an, uh, in a number of cases. So for instance, as we just discussed, when a node crashes, we want to replace the node. So the new node will re receive that catch-up package and then it will get the required uh, secret key share plus the required state. Or also, if a node was offline for uh, too long time, so because uh, its internet connection broke down or so, also it could request a catch-up package from the other nodes. Again, it would have all the information it requires to rejoin a subnet. Or if too many nodes of a subnet have crashed, they actually they, they lost too much inf information on, on the key shares, so they could not re uh, reconstruct that public key. But they still have the state. So and as, as the nodes regularly certify that state, what we could do, or actually what we, the NNS can do, is it will just generate a new sharing, a new public key, take that certified state, and again, the subnet uh, can be up and running, although in this case it was a different public key, but it will all be secure. The last but probably most important part that we can do with catch-up packages is that we can also upgrade the protocol because the catch-up package sort of defines uh, a state of the subnet from which operations can always uh, continue. So if, if uh, we want to upgrade the protocol, then we, we wait for the subnet to generate a catch-up package, and then we tell the subnet, okay, so now after uh, the next catch-up package, please run the new version of the protocol. And then that's how we can actually upgrade the protocol. We can fix bugs in the protocol if, if they happen or we can add new features to the protocol as well.
non-interactive uh, DKG and key resharing or just two ingredients of chain key technology. There's much more and we will have uh, talks about all of this uh, soon online. At the heart of uh, chain key technologies are consensus protocols that orchestrates all the different sub protocols. Of course, the consensus, uh, the main task of it is to collect and agree messages from users and get them executed. But uh, it also has to orchestrate the non-interactive DKG and the resharing between all the different nodes. It ensures that computations are done correctly. And even if some bugs happened because uh, of a hard disk failure or some cosmic glitches that, that flips some bits, that these bugs wouldn't spread to other subnets but uh, remain contained. It also orchestrates the resumption and the synchronization of state. It orchestrates all the upgrades, starting a new subnet from a given state. And another interesting feature is actually that the consensus protocols also provides the cure randomness to applications that is actually very, very hard to achieve in a correct way. So now we have seen what uh, chain key technology can actually do. Uh, it allows us to have a single public key of the internet computer, so all that is needed to verify a message from this internet computer is that single public key. It allows the NNS to add new subnets and scale the network forever. And it can even revive a subnet if too many nodes have failed. Or if nodes have crashed or nodes are compromised, they need to be re replaced. Chain key technology allows us uh, to recover from that and to maintain uh, the operations of a subnet. And finally, Chain key technology allows us to upgrade the protocol, to fix bugs, and to add new features. So really, chain key technology sort of makes the internet computer scale and round forever. So we have decentralized infinity. Thank you. <laughs>